Present our, our presenter tonight, uh, Miss Yvonne Barnes. And Yvonne, first of all, I'm going to say she's a proud member of the Orange Road Missionary Baptist Church. I thank God so much for that. Uh, last year before last, she was Teacher of the Year in Chapel Hill um, School System. So she comes tonight to share some valuable information with us. Yvonne Barnes has been, she's an English and avid educated in Chapel Hill, uh, Carborough City Schools for many years. She's also a member, as I said, of our church, our missionary's uh, ministry. Um, Yvonne remains, she's involved in many community endeavors, aiming at assisting both the homeless and victims of domestic violence. She was educated at North Carolina Central University, and she is currently finishing program work at at North Carolina State to become a certified English as a second language um, coordinator. Yvonne has witnessed, and achieve, witnessed the achievement gap between students of color grow in spite of many school initiatives. She decided to help by offering, by offering this seminar to community parents, which explained the roles of community participation which is a tremendous part to our children's growth and development. This seminar highlights early language development, the importance of sound, connection, and community, and parent strategies and resources. Yvonne is married to her husband's name is Ricky. Ricky is a golfer, and she has one son. So at this time, Yvonne will come with her presentation for us tonight and we pray that you will. It will be educational as well as enjoyable. Um, soon my, informa my information will be 
um, available to you via slide. My essential question is, in what ways can students and parents navigate early childhood, and that's what I'm focusing on, those years, okay, uh, to ensure academic success and success within our larger society. So again, I have information about elementary. I'm going to give you some of that today. But I also have elementary um, information about middle school, um, high school naturally, uh, and beyond. So if you'd like that information, please let me know. Oh, okay. Um, Yes, I just went over my essential question. Uh, teachers, educators know that we're not supposed to have any presentations without that essential question. So again, my essential question is, in what ways can students and parents navigate early childhood and elementary schools to ensure academic success and success within our larger society? Okay. Next slide. The questions that I'm going to consider uh, and answer for you are, include the following. First of all, what is the gap? Okay, we keep talking about this educational gap. What is this gap? What is this gap? You know, my kid is successful in school, uh, but he or she gets nervous during test taking time. Or my kid doesn't seem to have mastered the necessary skills. Or I've tried and tried, I just don't know what to do. Okay, so we're going to talk about this gap and the further implications of the gap. I'm also going to explain the idea of equity because um, a lot of us have this misconception that equity means giving someone something that we have that we can't get back. That's not what equity is, okay? I'm going to talk about how children develop language. Honestly, because of the program at State and because of my peers and my co-workers and just being in an environment with children for so long, I find the development of language incredibly fascinating, okay? I'm also going to talk about the role of caregivers and then I'm going to go into some best practices. All right. My contact information is, is simple. <laughs> it's my name, barnes.yvonne at yahoo.com. So if you have any questions about this presentation, please, please, please um, email me and I will be more than happy to either answer your questions or direct you to someone else, okay? Also, I have uh, sent a digital copy of my um, information to the church. So there's the church website and there's mine. Mine is real easy, y'all. Just lastname.first at yahoo.com. And you can contact me to set up a virtual community appointment because I'm very willing to talk to your communities about this education gap and the importance of early education at home. Okay. Thank you. All right, so the achievement gap starts early, okay? Um, people get um, really emotional when I show this slide, but this slide was from some years ago. I'm going to say about 2013 or 14. That's the latest information that I could find. Um, and also, uh, they use a term that I really don't care for, uh, welfare families. We're going to call those underfunded communities because that's what a welfare community is. It's a community where people don't pour in resources. So therefore, there are very few resources. But if you look at gap between um, children, that is children between the ages of 10 months, 24 months, 36 months, that gap persists in words, the amount of words that they acquire. They're all very, very different. And I'm going to explain why they're so different. Next slide. There is some hopeful information, everyone. 
Uh, and I found this during my research for school, but there is upward trending changing data for our gap, okay? All right, between the years of 2015 and 2018, African American students had a 3.4 percentage point nation gain, national gain. That is amazing, okay? Hispanic students had a 4.4 percentage point national gain. Native American students had a 4 percentage point national gain. And Asian students had a 4.5 percentage point gain, okay? All right. Um, so that is hopeful information. That is hopeful information for all of us, okay? All right, so this is what the gap is actually related to. It has very, very little to do with um, a scoring done by a teacher. It has to do with the national tests that students take, okay? Or not national, I'm sorry, state tests, okay? All right, so these are gap-related scores, all right? If you look at this, you'll see that if a student, you, they bring home these scores, okay? And often they bring home these scores and these scores are included in a long list of lengthy, tiresome, cumbersome information. Some of us honestly just wanna know, did my child pass? <laughs> That's all we wanna know. Did my child pass? What do I need to do? Where do I need to go? But if you look at these scores, a student can make a two on this test and still, based on the state criteria, everyone, I'm not sure what it is in North Carolina, still not be successful on this test. What they want students to do, and these are, again, state tests, they're timed, but students are given plenty of time to take them. The tests are curved according to the state average. In other words, the students who determine the test scores are the students who, um, who perform at a certain level, okay? Um, but they give and take, they give a little leeway for other students. So it's not like, you know, the state isn't trying to make some adjustments, all right? Although these tests measure classroom skills, I think it's very interesting to me that these tests also measure something else. They measure the language that you bring into the classroom. They measure your assessment. They assess whether or not you have successfully picked up certain testing language as you have gone through your school year, okay? All right, so I wanna talk to you all about, you saw those, I put the low scores on the top. I want to talk to you about the implications of low scores, not for young children, but this is what happens when you get to high school if you are a low scorer, okay? This is the, these are the implications. And these questions actually came from a real, like, science um, assessment, okay? All right, so I'm going to give you an example of how language affects these tests, okay? So the question is, during strenuous exercise, whatever, whatever, okay? Let's say student A doesn't know what strenuous means. Student A forgets what reduced means, okay? Student A can almost tell what demonstrates means, okay? But student A can remember the terms at the bottom of the paper, which are excretion, metabolism, homeostasis, and synthesis. Well, if student A can remember those science terms, then student A might be able to pass this test. However, if student A cannot remember those science terms and doesn't know this testing language, strenuous, reduced, those science-related terms, then student, it is probable that student A will just either skip it or just feel defeated or may not get it right, okay? All right. On the other hand, we have student B, okay? So again, this is a question uh, from a ninth grade test, all right? 
So it's about, the question is about a sea turtle and some other things. I'm sorry, y'all, science is not my, <laughs> my greatest strength. But you can always get a, qu a copy of these questions. Again, y'all, this is a ninth grade test, okay? So there are further implications for students who have not been successful in elementary school. Further implications. So let's say student B knows what remote and authorities means. She knows test language, okay? Test language, students, uh, teachers begin teaching test language in third grade, okay? All right, or I'm sorry, second grade. This is what my niece told me, second grade, okay? She also knows how to eliminate answers. So student B has the advantage over student A, not only because she understand this, this, understands this language, but also I believe because student B had access to this language early on, okay? All right, so a couple of years ago, yeah, so not the word cloud, everyone, but a couple of years ago, I taught ninth grade English in summer school. And I told my students, I said, look, I'm going to put together this amazing presentation. You can ask me any question about any word under one condition. And they were like, what is it, Ms. Barnes? I need to use the words that you don't know in my presentation, okay? So if you look at that umbrella, words like infer, context, identify, clarify, present, evaluate, factors, restriction. These are words that we kind of assume that kids know. We assume that they know. We assume that they've had access to these words. Educators have been working really, really hard at trying to get our kids to a level where they understand these words. But I strongly believe that the understanding of these words happens earlier than ninth grade, much earlier than ninth grade. Um, during that summer school class, I was able to help my students learn process of elimination. If you have three sad words <laughs> for your multiple choice, it is likely that the fourth happy word is the answer, okay? I also was able to help them with um, stems of uh, prefixes and suffixes explain to them that if you add M-A-L to a word, if you have a word like align and you add M to it, it makes it a negative word, malign. That's very different from align. So they were able to use these strategies um, in passing this test because this ninth grade class in particular was in summer school because they did not pass these high stakes tests. The high stakes tests begin in third grade with reading and math, reading and math tests. That means that second grade teachers are already teaching these kids this test language, okay? That means that children who enter school at a deficit of words are at a deficit in passing these tests, okay? So second grade teachers have this dual role. They have to educate their children about ideas. They have to introduce, introduce new vocabulary sets. And they also have to teach their kids this language of testing. This testing language stays with them until they graduate from high school. It probably follows them I know it follows them to college, but if you think about test language, there are a few jobs today where you don't have to be certified. So you still have test language when you are a fireman, okay? You have some certification involved with that. When you are a barber, you have to go back for your license from what I understand for that, right? When you are a teacher, <laughs> You still have test language. There's always test language, okay? <laughs> All right. Um, you also have to remember that, and this is, this is, I'm sorry, y'all. I, I really hate to break it down like this, 
but eight grade scores are used to determine high school schedules. They are used <laughs> to determine high school schedules. They just are. That's the closest thing that we have to look at to determine whether or not a child would be comfortable or whether or not a child has the intellectual capacities to take certain classes in high school. Okay. Is there one before that one? Is there a slide before that one? There it is. No, that's not it. Okay. Well, I'm missing a slide, but I can talk about it. Okay. All right. So now I want to talk about equity. I want to talk about equity and I want to explain equity in terms that we can understand. Okay. All right. So equity is this idea that really started when schools were desegregated. It started when schools were desegregated. In ninth, but schools were desegregated in the 50s. It was Brown versus the Board of Education. In 1965, Lyndon B. Johnson decided to establish these rules, okay? Um, this was legally established in 1965, and the goal was to provide quality and equality in educating young people. That was his goal, okay? And also to provide federal monies uh, for schools in vulnerable areas. Don't forget, up until this point, there have been people who traveled through these communities, through these underfunded communities, and saw what schools were like, okay? So, President, former President Johnson decided, we need to do something about this. So he set a national law in motion. Now, I say that schools were desegregated by Brown versus Board of Education in the 50s, right? Well, I can remember in Kinston, North Carolina, in 1972, when um, we were bused for the first time to the white school. Actually, we took a cab. It was me and four of my friends, okay? All right, so states resisted this kind of uh, bringing together of people. They just resisted it, okay? All right, so let me explain to you what equity, so equity started there. Let me explain to all of you what equitable practices are. Look at the picture on the left. That is equality, okay, right? Everyone has a box. The box is all the same size. But look at that little fella that's like me trying to see over people at a concert. He can't see anything. Look at the guy in the middle. His eyes are barely over the fence. The only person that can see is the person uh, to, I think, your far right, maybe? Left, <laughs> okay? Look at the other side. The little fellow with the purple shirt on can now see over the fence. The young man in the middle can still see over the fence. The guy with the blue shirt on can still see over the fence. He hasn't lost anything by giving up that box. He's just as happy at whatever they're at, maybe it looks like a baseball game. That is equity. That is giving people the resources that they need in order to get where they need to go. Okay, so if that analogy doesn't work for you, I am going to use one that we love the barbecue, okay? All right, so everybody, all, we know what the barbecue is. <laughs> we talk about who's invited to the barbecue, who's not invited to the barbecue. So I'm having the barbecue, right? I invite everyone. I invite my church family. I invite my friends. I invite my gym friends. I invite my teacher friends. I invite my homegirls, homeboys. Everybody's invited to this party. My brother's a DJ. I cook all this food, right? All this food. And so, this is what happens. Everyone gets to the barbecue. Everyone arrives at the barbecue. I should use my standard English skills. 
Uh, <laughs> we get to the bar, they get to the barbecue, okay? Everyone begins to get hungry. I have cooked this amazing spread, and I can't cook banana pudding, but I asked one of my friends, make me a banana pudding. So she makes all these big trays. We got ribs, we got fried fish, we got collard greens, we got potato salad. I know I left something off. I got a big industrial barbecue sauce for the extra barbecue people. I got hot sauce for the hot sauce people. So it's time to eat. In my mind, I start thinking about that thing. I invited, I invited my pastor. <laughs> I start thinking about that thing and I say, hmm, you people, I don't know if I want them eating up all my food. Okay, so it's time to eat. Everyone is hungry. People have worked up a sweat because my brother is on the ones and twos. And something just comes over me and I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna serve this food. So I serve the food. I give everyone a tablespoon of potato salad, a tablespoon of collard greens, a squirt of barbecue sauce, two short ribs, a little piece of fried fish, a little, little bitty piece, I don't know, flounder, something, some little. I give everyone the same plate. My grandmother is 92, she's there. She looks at me, she said, Vaughn, I sure would like to have some more of that banana pudding. And I say, Grandma, I'm sorry, but I'm saving this banana pudding for whatever I'm saving it for. You get that same tablespoon like everybody else. That's equality, right? I fed everybody, didn't I? I fed everybody. Everybody got something to eat. Everybody mad at me, probably ain't never coming back to my house. <laughs> but I did feed you, I fed you. That's equality. You know what equity is? Knowing that my family loves to eat, knowing that my friends love to eat, seeing the joy on people's faces when they eat food and when they dance around a little bit, having a good time talking to people and just allowing people to really have a seat at the table. I controlled that situation. I controlled it. I made it equal for everyone, but it was equitable for no one. And I did that because of my own selfishness, okay? So that is the difference between equality and equity. Does everyone understand what I'm saying now? Did I make that clear? Okay. All right. This is one of my sheroes. Uh, she made an impromptu speech when she was fighting for women's rights. This is Sojourner Truth. I thought it was interesting that she could not write, but she learned to write her name. Uh, and I thought it was interesting that she made the speech that we still teach in English. And this speech has to do with equity. She's saying, look, women need rights like men. Why would you begrudge us the right to vote? Why? It does nothing for you. It takes nothing away from you to give us our rights. And this is just a quotation from Sojourner Truth. And it reads, you need not be afraid to give us, give us our rights for fear we will take too much. What are people afraid of when it comes to equity? You're not losing anything when you help someone achieve. You're not. You're giving voice to the voiceless. You're giving power to the powerless. That's what we were put here for. And that's not a conservative or a liberal view that is a human being in the United States view. I will always believe that. I firmly believe that. All right. So, schools have become more equitable. I'm sorry that you can't read that. <laughs> I love color, and sometimes I go a little bit too far. So I'm gonna read it for you. Schools have become more equitable, and honestly, I believe it is because we have more minorities at the head of that table than we've ever had. I know so many minorities 
who are becoming um, administrators, who are working at the district level, who are working on testing, who are working in small groups with children, who are hosting clubs for children, who are doing things within their communities and their churches. We have gotten a seat at that table. It has taken forever and a day. <laughs> However, we are getting that seat at that table. So let me talk about some of the equitable practices that I believe schools uh, are putting in place. First of all, if you have a lesson plan, you better have representation of various cultures in there. Okay? Usually your principal does not want to hear it if he looks in your room and he sees that there's no representation of anyone who looks different than you. Okay? Schools also provide, um, what is this? Oh, provision of and accessibility of materials. So um, if, for instance, um, I live in an environment where internet access is impossible. When I leave school, I usually don't, I don't even know if I'm gonna have Wi-Fi. I don't know what I'm gonna have, okay? My teachers are responsible for knowing that information and providing me access, the same access to materials as everyone else, okay? Parent contact has become incredibly important. Grading has become very transparent, very transparent. We put it on the computer, you can look in there. Most of the time, y'all get a thousand notifications a day. Parents complain, oh Lord, y'all just notifying me to death. But <laughs> that's a part of that important parent contact, okay? There's lots and lots and lots of assistance for students with special needs. I really like that. My mom and I talk about that a lot. Um, she was a, a good reader, but when she reads, she still, when she reads out loud, uh, her mind gets stuck on whatever she's on, but she can explain it to you. Um, had she had some help with that, perhaps she would have gotten over that, okay? All right. Um, there's also a provision of compassionate teachers, tutors, counselors, and mentors, okay? All right. Um, there are lunch and meal programs for accessibility for all students. As a matter of fact, most districts provided lunch, sometimes I think breakfast, in certain communities throughout this COVID time. We weren't even in school, uh, and schools made sure that children, not only children, y'all, the elderly, um, the disabled, and often um, those kids with like special needs got what they needed, okay? All right, uh, access to community programs. Again, schools are really, really trying to branch out and work with communities to get in technology, to get, to get some technology in there, uh, to get STEM programs going, you know to heighten awareness of society's issues, those kinds of things, all right? Um, and last but not least, and I'm shouting out all of my hardworking friends um, in uh, administration, schools are providing leadership which implements strategies created to close the gap. Your leaders are talking to you about what we need to do, what we need to teach, how we need to teach it, to whom we need to teach it, okay? So this is a conversation, this is an ongoing conversation in many districts, okay? All right, so I said all of that, and I am going to say here that schools are really trying, okay? I know that some of us have had bad experiences, however, <laughs> I, I don't know that we should actually give up on a whole system because we have a bad experience. We shouldn't give up on a whole group of people when we have a bad experience, okay? We just should not. And there's, if you feel like you're having a bad experience, there's probably a dialogue that needs to take place between you and a teacher 
you know, just reach out. I'd like to talk to you about some things that I believe are important. They'll connect with you. Okay. All right, so that next slide, I love that picture. I found it online. It's by an author named Sarah Neal, uh, African Dad and Daughter Love. Our children need our help. Now, I could very well have put up a picture of a mama rocking her child, you know, of a teacher with all these children <laughs> sitting around her, but I purposefully chose the image of a black man with his daughter, okay? Our children need our help. And by that, I don't just mean black women. I mean black men too. We need you, we need you in this fight. Yes, we struggle, we all struggle. I'm in the struggle with you. Yes, we have to overcome so much. Yes, a lot of us did not have fathers to look up to. This is, a, this is all new for us. This is all new. However, we need you, okay? All right. I, I've watched Hamilton a million times now because I get Disney Plus, and it said you, in order to win the game, you got to have skin in the game. Dads, we need you. Even if you're not in the house, you need to be a presence, okay? All right. So, um, I had another slide in there that I don't see. I guess I, I don't know. Um, I said meaningful education is gender inclusive. I'm not sure why my slides are not showing up, but I had a picture in there of a family, a beautiful, beautiful family. Um, they are good friends of mine. They are the Thomases. They live in Durham. Um, they are members of Mount Calvary. But the father, Montez Thomas, and I can't talk about the dad without talking about the mom, Montez and Sharon have two children. Samuel and Gia. Gia, I think, might be five or six, maybe. And Gia is currently online reading to children, reading children's books to children. And her dad asks her questions afterwards. I find it interesting that I just found out, Montez is like a brother to me, uh, but I just found out that he leads First Calvary Summer Book Club for boys and girls ages six through nine, okay? All right, the thing about this, in, the interesting about this club is that it expanded because of COVID. So it's not just local children. It's children all over the United States. It's children in other countries. This is his first time holding a club in virtual spaces. He holds this club particularly because he recognized that black boys, black males, tend to be lower in literacy than other groups. So he's doing his part in order to make sure that everyone is like successful, okay? All right. Um, Montez picks books where black males are lead characters in all of his books. So if you would like his information and you want your child, grade six to nine, to join his club, please email me and I'll be more than happy to give that to you, okay? All right, so whenever I visit a home ever, you can go to the next slide, thank you so much. All right, so whenever I visit a home ever, 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 and I see a kid, I see a child, honestly, the first thing I'm looking for are the books. I want to know where your books are. I want to know where your bookshelf is. I want to know whether or not you're reading to your child. I want to know whether or not your child is picking up your sounds. I want to know whether or not you are reading to your child while you're playing Candy Crush. I want to know whether or not you're giving your child 15 minutes of undivided attention because that's what our children need from the time before they are born, 15 minutes of reading per night, 15 minutes of reading every night, okay? All right, so I'm going to go into this conversation about language and where language comes from. 
I find this conversation very, very, very interesting. I love this conversation. This is my favorite part because I am a lover of words, okay? All right. Um, if you look at my slideshow, you'll see that there are certain theorists who said certain things about language, and these are theories to which I ascribe, okay? Children begin language long before they begin uh, actually putting words together, okay? That is why it is important women, men, grandmas, glamas, papas, all of that, to begin reading to your child. I would say start reading to your child before your child enters the world. Your child needs to know your voice. Your child needs to know love through your voice. Love through your voice, acceptance through your voice, okay? All right. So there are a couple of theories that I wanna talk about. The first one has to do with um, a word theorist. His name was Chomsky. And Chomsky believed that children learn how to, to uh, make sound without adults. And I think he's right. If you look at children and their first sounds, um, children start so early today, but their first sounds are cooing sounds, okay? They're not looking at anyone when they make these sounds. They're just becoming adjusted to their, their voice, their vocal cords, okay? Not only do they start making cooing sounds, eventually they start doing that thing where they're like, oh, <laughs> wherever you go, you know. You can be in church and they just start breaking out of I don't know what they t I don't know what they're doing and you're taking them out. You're running out of church like the hair's on fire. I don't know, but <laughs> they have to become accustomed to their own voice. Okay, all right. So they become accustomed to their own voices. All right, and then they figure out somehow that their lips can make sound. And they do all of that without us. They do all of that without us. For instance, if you think about a kid who's between 12 and 15 months, they can usually say the word, dad, dad. They can usually say the word, baba, okay? Mama is harder because the sound comes from the nose and the lips, so mama is a little harder, okay? But children will say baba all day long dad that all day long, okay? And that's after they become familiar with their lips. There's a step before that. After they start making all those sounds, then they start going That's when they begin, begin becoming familiar with the sound and the movement of their own lips. And honestly, I think they do that because when they're teething, it feels good, okay? <laughs> all right, so they begin making these single words at 12 to 15 months. Okay. They become more adept at language by the time they're 18 months. They can say at least 24 words. They begin putting things into sentences. Bye, mama. No, dad, dad. <laughs> stop it. I remember my niece, stop it. <laughs> so they begin putting, they begin forming these sentences, okay? All right. By the time they're age two, they have between 50 and 60 words, and they can make two word combinations. They can probably make more than two word combinations. I go potty. I love you. Bye, Grandma. They can say a lot, a lot of things, okay? We need to catch children before they get to that level, before they get to that level, so that while they're learning how to form these words, they're also learning how to read these alphabets, okay? So, 15 minutes a night. You read to a child. You read to a newborn. A newborn needs to know the feel of your voice. Voices have feel to them as well, okay? I always, I, when I teach the words euphony and cacophony, uh, I use myself as an example, okay? Euphony is smooth and melodious. Cacophony is my voice, okay? It's loud. It might be a little abrasive at times, okay? All right, so children need to know what their parents' voices feel like, 
okay? They also need to know expressions on faces when you read. You need to make this journey exciting for them. It doesn't have to be you reading a thesaurus. <laughs> you don't have to read, uh, I don't know, I don't know what to say right here, uh, a drama. You can find the most simple book with the most simple words and just begin reading to those children. By the time that child is two years old, that child is going to get his favorite book off the shelf for you to read. That child can mimic your language. That child has begun really looking and thinking about alphabets. Because we need to choose books that don't have a lot of writing in it, but have beautiful illustrations of our children, our faces, and beautiful um, illustrations of other children, other faces, so that they can become accustomed to knowing, hey, there's a world out there. Okay? All right, we don't want to, we don't want our children to measure their lives in teaspoons. Okay? We want them to understand that there is a huge world which is awaiting them, and they can open up and unlock that world through literacy and language. Okay? All right. Um, by the time a child is three, they're very, um, how do I say this? So two and three-year-olds are very um, egocentric, okay? Um, they don't understand that you might have a story too, but they can tell you about their story. You want them to be able to tell you about books, to express their likes and dislikes in a way that is standardized, that people can understand them outside of the home. Like you want them to be, become good communicators. And in order to make that happen, we, we need to begin reading to them very early, very early, very early, okay? All right, can you go to our next slide? Okay, yeah. Children want to learn. They want to know everything. What's that? What are you doing? Why is that? What's that? Who is that? <laughs> they want to know everything, okay? All right. Um, our job is to frame education incredibly early, incredibly early. And for those of us, and it, also I would like to say that the gap also exists because certain people have access to daycares, daycare centers. Those are learning centers. If you do not have access to a daycare or a learning center, no biggie. Be a daycare. Be a learning center. Ask someone who has access, hey, what are y'all doing over there? What are you doing? I want to do that too. Whatever you do is what I want. You want that for your child, I want that for my child. That's equity, okay? All right, start some stuff. Have reading, maybe reading a uh, half hour, reading 15 minutes while all the kids come over. Reading 15 minutes where your child is over, okay? Leave books in other people's homes. Leave books in other people's homes. Say, you know, my child goes to stay with my aunt and uh, I take his favorite book and I ask her, if you will just read this book to this kid for 15 minutes at night, you can help me change the trajectory of his life. You can help me, okay? Say my child goes to stay with um, his uncle, Uncle Matthew. <laughs> uncle Matt, I need you to read this book. 15 minutes, it won't take you long, okay? All right, the only thing is, if he asks you to read it again, read it again, okay? You might end up reading the same book 30,000 times. Read it 30,000 times. That's how children learn, okay? They learn from sight and sound, okay? All righty. Let's see what slide surprise I have now. Okay. <laughs> All right, this was good, okay. Uh, I was listening to a presentation by a woman named Laura J. Colker. She was a student at University of Tennessee, 
And this is the, the important information that I need for us to have, okay? This is the equity information. This is the equity information, okay? By age three, and I'm not even going to tell you how many words she said uh, of a gap exists between the haves and the have-nots, but by age three, there is a huge word gap between the haves and the have-nots. And there are some socioeconomic influences. The first, again, is access to daycare. I was talking to one of my daycare friends, and she told me, she was like, well, Yvonne, we don't teach reading. However, by the time these kids turn three, we have them writing alphabets. We have them writing alphabets. Children who stay at grandma's house may not be writing their alphabets at three, year old, three years old. We need for our children to be doing the same things as other people. So I'm impressing on all of you parents to make sure that if your child is not in a daycare, is not in a learning center, that that child is learning the same things as other children. That's what I want. That's the gift we can give them, the gift of knowledge, okay? All right, back to my slide. Children in have communities, I say have communities, have access to parks, fresh air, and clean water, okay? There's low neighborhood violence. There are better food selections in half neighborhoods. There are closer job commutes, or people can choose to work from home. There are better supported community activities in schools. And I added there, there is health insurance, there is medical care in a have community. This is why I worry about my have not communities. Because have not communities do not have access to a lot of those things. But have not communities have access to churches. They have access to community centers. They have access to people, directors of programs who could bring in people, okay? And I can help with that. I love helping with things like that. I love helping getting those things established. So what I would like for my haves to do, and by have, I mean working and middle class. Because if you have access to those things, you're indeed a have. You're richer than most of the world, okay? So if you have access to those things, you need to share some of your resources with a have not. Share some of your resources with a have not. Before COVID, I had mustered up the courage. I said, you know what? I'm gonna do it. So every time I saw someone with a young child, very young child, and I could see the child was thinking about literacy and trying to learn how to talk, I would just go up to that person and start talking. Start talking about what that person, I, I would ask, what kinds of books are you reading? This kid is really smart. You don't want this kid to fall access to some children's books. And I would give out my card. It took a lot of courage to do that. <laughs> but I said, I'm here to help. I'm here to serve, okay? So service doesn't always mean doing the thing that's comfortable. Sometimes you gotta do the uncomfortable, okay? All right. Thank goodness. All right. <laughs> so we can combat these challenges, again, we are the haves, many of us are the haves, okay? We can advocate for equity for all students. Attend a board meeting, volunteer. Write our local, le letter, local leaders letters about education, okay? Seek our leaders during town hall meetings. Post and share information about school resources. A lot of times on Facebook, all I'm doing is passing on information. Just passing on information. Good information, okay? All right, good and helpful information. Include family information about family literacy during group gatherings. We need some packets going. We need to give out some business cards. We need to be giving out some children's books. 
We need to be doing all we can to make sure that we raise a generation of learners, learners for life. We need to abandon that us versus them way of thinking about children and society as a whole. That us versus them way of thinking has separated families. It has separated families. It has separated sisters and brothers. It has separated us so much. There is no us versus them. There's just us. There's just us. That's all there is, okay? And when we're gone, we want our children to be the next us. Again, the same things that I wanted for my son, someone who lives in an underdeveloped neighborhood wants for his or her child. We need to provide that access. We need to start on that, okay? Last but not least, is that on? Could you go back a slide, please? Last but not least, we need to welcome ally assistance, okay? All right, I have a ton of allies. They help me with everything. They're talking about helping me grant right. Uh, if I say I'm taking up clothing for the poor, they're right there. If I say I need books for this neighborhood, they're right there. We need to welcome that kind of assistance. It is necessary, it is necessary, and it is necessary for us to explain to people why we need that kind of uh, assistance. That again is an equity issue, okay? All right, so going back to the things that we can do within our homes, that's the next slide. Yeah, things that we can do within our homes. Read and let read. So what if um, Thomas brings you the same book 500 times? Read it 500 times. <laughs> That's his favorite book. Read it. Let him pretend to read it until he can read it. Children begin recognizing letters very early, earlier than what we think, okay, if they have exposure. Use facial expressions and gestures, okay? All right, the, the thing that I love about our church is that we invite people to speak, we invite people to the podium, and they come up, our children come up with such passion, you know, uh, I think it's absolutely amazing. Facial expressions, gestures, let them know that you too are enjoying the process. Even when you're tired, you have to do this in front of children. Sing and recite poetry. Those are very important. Again, sound is crucial to small children, and not just the sound of the computer, and not just the sound of the TV. Your voice, okay? Poetry, important. Converse with children, converse with them. That means whatever they're talking about is what we're talking about at that time, okay? All right, um, my hairstylist. If I call her at a certain time, I never call her on Wednesdays. I try not to, actually I did one time, because I know that she is spending time with her grandson. She is engaged with him. She loves him. One time I think I called her and she texted me back, we playing games, you know. Just get involved with these children. Invite them to share their ideas. You don't have to agree with everything. Just listen, listen. Just listen, okay? I said introduce varied vocabulary sets. So there are different vocabulary sets that we can introduce to our children, maybe not during COVID, <laughs> but after COVID. There are museums, okay? I'm always interesting and I'm always surprised when I go into museums, and I go into a lot of museums, you, usually when we traveled when our son was young, one of the requirements was that we went to a museum. That was a requirement, okay? We can do some fun stuff, we get on some rides and eat some popcorn or whatever we do on vacation, but we had to find a museum, okay? All right, that introduces a distinct vocabulary set that teaches your children to look at a picture and think about it. Think about the colors, think about the shapes, that kind of stuff. Parts offer a different kind of vocabulary set. Outdoors offers a different vocabulary set. Before we came on live, 
my pastor was telling me excitedly about his gardening and how he's going to expand it. And that is a whole vocabulary set. That is a whole vocabulary set. How to till land, you know, how to weed a garden, how to plant this, when to plant this, when this is fresh or ripe. Those are things you can teach little kids. They want to hear it. Okay, they want to hear from you. Cars, that's a vocabulary set. Pass me that wrench, okay? All right, that, that's a whole vocabulary set. So get those kids involved in some of the things that we're doing that we believe are mundane activities. They will actually be happy. Music is a vocabulary set, okay? All right, our church musician is sitting in front of me, so, <laughs> so I'm not going to pretend to know all of it. <laughs> But I know what a scale is, and I know what staccato means, okay? And I know what a flat is, and I know what, what's the other thing on the other side? A sharp, ah, ha, 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 okay? All right, so I know what those things mean. That is a vocabulary set, okay? And I said gardening is a vocabulary set. So make sure that we are teaching our children vocabulary sets so that they can use those sets in inference in other things, and other skills, okay? All righty. As I told you before, by second grade, education focus shifts from reading skills to question stems. Second grade teachers, my hat is off to you, seriously. Not only do you have to somehow catch up students who are behind, but you also have to teach the language of problem solving, okay? Let me explain to everyone what a question stem is. This is academic language that teachers always use and we assume other people know what it means, okay? A question stem is the part of the question which presents the problem to be solved. So it's usually the beginning of a question. How do you? What caused? What is the relevance of? What is the symbolism of? Those kinds of things, those are question stems. By the time children are in third grade, they should have that skill mastered. And in, if, you, if you ask me for a packet, I actually have in there question stems for little kids, okay? So when little kids turn about don't do it at first, please don't, don't confuse our kids. <laughs> Just read to them until they're about four or five. About five, you can start using question stems. So what do you think happens here? So imagine that this, did you like this person? Why? Did you not like this person? Why not? What made this a, what made this a character that you're gonna remember? What do you think mommy wants you to know about this book? What do you think daddy wants you to know about this book? How do you feel about this? These are questions that five-year-olds can answer, okay? So start that question stemming very early. And again, if you contact me, I will provide a packet with all this stuff in there, okay? All right, so we have educators working to teach that language in addition to problem-solving strategies. So again, second and third grade teachers, hats off, I, I don't know what else to say, <laughs> okay? So by second grade, our children need to be not only reading fluently, but understanding what they're reading. That doesn't leave a lot of time between entering school and second grade. That's not a lot of time. One of my friends gave me the exact day, num day um, uh, day amount, it's not, it's not a lot. That's why I said early literacy is incredibly important, okay? All right, I hope, there it is. <laughs> All right, these are sample question stems for children, and I've gone over some of those, okay? All right, there are level, there are even levels of thinking to the question stems. One, those are the simplest questions you can ask. Choose are a little bit harder, you have to apply your knowledge. Three questions involve strategic thinking. 
or is extending extended thinking. What do you think happens when this? Okay. The great thing about this is that a lot of us, and my mom included and myself included, a lot of us use biblical stories in order to teach these things, in order to teach these question stems. Okay. All righty. See what we have here. Such a surprise. <laughs> All right. Uh, children need books which instruct. They need quiet space for thinking. Again, this 15 minutes should not be bombarded with you on the phone with anyone. It should not be bombarded with you stressed out thinking about your whole day. 15 minutes isn't a lot to give to a child. Okay? It's not a lot to give to a child. 15 minutes, that's all I'm asking. They need a quiet space for thinking. They need a space they can call their own, okay? We need to provide books which demonstrate compassion. We need to provide books which have our images in them. We need to provide books to let them know, again, that the world is bigger than the one in which they live. I think this is also important. Um, we need to help our children to show love to other people. Okay, how do we do that? We do that through volunteering. We do that through saying a kind word to someone else. We say that through showing them love instead of displeasure in our eyes. It's real easy to get off work. You had a bad day. You know, you got to go home. You don't feel like cooking, but you ain't got but $5. <laughs> so you're in the house. You're mad. You're already mad. And your child comes up to you. And it's real easy to just say, you know what? Come on here. Let's read this book. Okay? That is not showing a child the approval in your eyes and the love in your heart. You need to see that. Show them. They need you. They need you. I always say, I always say this. I say that in school, I can be the voice in your child's head for about 10 months. I can be the voice in your child's head. I can. I can be the voice in your child's head. I can never be the voice in your child's heart. That's you. That's not me. That's you. Okay? All right. There are neurological um, benefits to early education. Of course, it puts your child at an, uh, at an advantage to excel in front of other kids. They have more confidence. There are psychological benefits to being able to read. Okay? I know, I know when a child doesn't read well. They don't want to read in front of their peers. They get real nervous. Sometimes they get defiant. That's when you have a child that will flip a desk and walk out of your room before they read in front of everybody. They don't want anybody to hear them reading because they can't read, okay? All right, there are also social benefits to being able to read. You want your child to be able to present himself in a good way when he or she walks out of your door. And again, there are language implications. If you can master one language, it is probable that if you are a child, you can master another. All right. Kindergarten criteria. Is that on there? Yeah. Kindergarten criteria. All right. So I'm on to kindergarten. All right. Kindergarten criteria, which I have written down somewhere in this notebook, but I know it by heart. Okay. <laughs> All right. Kindergartners. Did everybody know there was criteria for getting into kindergarten? It's so interesting that there is, okay? Your children need to know many of their alphabets. Your children need to know how to recognize their name even if they can't spell it. Your children need to know their address. Your children still need to know their phone number. They need to know that, okay? All right, your children need to know um, some other things. They need to know some colors. They need to know probably, I think, all the colors. They need to know several shapes. Nobody wants them to know what an octagon is, but you best know what a circle is, okay? They need to know their shapes. They need to know all of those things before they get to school. If they do not know those things, someone will work to catch them up on those things. However, 
If your children do not know those things when they get into school, it is likely that they're going to be a little bit behind the other kids. None of us wants that. I don't want it, okay? None of us want that, I'm sorry. I don't want it. I won't accept it, and I think we should start on these things at home. You can buy manipulatives, you can buy toys that teach colors, you can learn songs that teach about the colors, you can have their names somewhere in their room in big letters. They need to have that name somewhere, okay? You can have grandma teach them the ABC song, you can have people pointing out letters to them that teach them the letters, those kinds of things. We need to do better with getting our children ready for this kindergarten thing. Now, my next slide has to do with Lexile reading scores, okay? This is, again, that academic language that a lot of us don't know about. I find this interesting that I've learned about Lexile reading scores only after I put my son in school, okay? We knew that he was a good reader. So we didn't worry about Lexile scoring, but every time we had one of those meetings, his Lexile score would come up. So I was like, what is that? So I started research researching. Lexile reading scores are the nationwide average reading scores. We want our children to be at a level where they are supposed to be when they enter school. So this next slide describes or explains what a Lexile score is, okay? All right, so there's an average reading score for your child's age group. You see the average? If you're, you want your child to be either in the average or 100 Lexile, is that? Greater than and no more than 75 Lexile less than. Okay, most books that are published today have Lexile scores on them, which I find fascinating and interesting. Okay, all right, I think I have a slide that says here's where we need to be. And that is just reiterating the Lexile score. Your children's Lexile scores are obtained when they enter school. They read to their teacher. They read individually to their teachers, okay? From there, and from a series of questions, children, uh, teachers can determine the level on which your child is likely to learn for that year, is likely to, because there are, oops, there are um, exemptions to every story, okay? All right, I have some strategies for us, and I have a copy of the Lexile scores for each age level. So for five-year-olds, there's a Lexile score. For eight-year-olds, there's a Lexile score. For high school students, there's a Lexile score. So again, all of those are included in my packet. How do you find out the Lexile score for your child? It was the hardest thing for me to find. People just acted like they didn't want to tell me this. I don't know if it was a secret or what. But you have access to your child's cumulative folder. That cumulative folder exists in the office with your child's counselor. It's not a secret. It's not locked in a safe. It's there at your school. Most of this stuff is online now, so you can figure it out, okay? All right, so we have some strategies. Again, read 15 minutes per night. Make reading the standard in all homes. Use facial expressions. Even here at a church that's usually full and full of love, I'm in here, I got a crowd of three, four, <laughs> and I am using my entire existence to show expression. Children need to see it as well. I feel like my audience will go to sleep if I don't keep doing this, okay? All right, so sing with children, recite poetry, Go over new words. If they say, what's that? Tell them what it is. If you have to tell them 10 times, tell them 10 times, okay? Add field trip experiences after COVID. <laughs> and I said anything can be a field trip. Go to the strawberry field, pick some strawberries. That's a field trip, okay? 
All right, give children time to learn meanings before moving on. Don't start all that question asking though until they're ready. You know when they're ready. About five years old, they can handle the questions. A two-year-old is gonna get turned off real quick you start asking them all them questions. They'll ask you because they're so egocentric, but they don't want you asking them, okay? All right, I think I have the, there it is. All right, so this is text Lexile ranges, okay? So this gives you, and I'm not gonna read it to you, this gives you some idea of where people should be on the Lexile score, okay? Again, I have a packet containing this information. You don't have to take notes right now, just get at me and I will definitely pass it on, okay? All right. All right, so we need to help our children get in the room where it happens. Okay, again, another Hamlet emphasis. Um, I am so upset because I had two authors to talk about three before this slide, but I thought about equity, thought about providing resources and access to resources, and I also thought about an interesting training that I attended two or three years ago on civil rights, grassroots civil rights movements. During that conference, I learned that there were, tw there were so many people behind the scenes that were never, ever, ever um, acknowledged or celebrated. Civil rights didn't just happen because of one person. Civil rights didn't happen because of two people. It happened on the backs of hundreds of thousands of people. This is one of the ladies that helped to make it happen. I thought about this. Movements need funding. All movements need funding. That's why people are donating to certain movements today. Movements need funding. And I said, you know, where did the funding come from for the civil rights movement? If you think about things like meetings at churches, Electricity needs to be paid for. If you think about people who had to take off of their jobs or perhaps got fired because of civil rights, they needed money to survive. If you think about a population who in the 1950s and 60s, if you had three pairs of shoes, you were somebody, okay? So you marched all night in one pair, you had a church fair, you had another pair. Who was gonna pay for shoes for these people? Okay? Who was going to provide access to bicycles? Who was going to provide cabs for them? So this lady, Georgia Gilmore, was a cook. And I heard she could make the best pies and fried chicken in the South. She was from Alabama. This lady, out of her kitchen, practically funded a lot of the civil rights movement. She would sell chicken sandwiches. She would sell pies, she would sell cakes, and those people who were her friends and allies who said, well, I don't have any money to donate to this cause, she, you know what she would tell them? She would be like, you know what? Don't worry about it. Sell some cake slices. There were times when people didn't realize they were buying these things to fund a movement. That's this one woman, okay? Thankfully, there's a story about her now, and I looked it up, and I thought it was very interesting that she had a story written about her. It's called Pies from Nowhere, okay? I think it's the last slide. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. No, okay. So anyway, her story is called Pies from Nowhere. And um, it's a recent story, and it just tells the story of this woman who helped to fund this movement. So, like I said, our gifts come in different packages. We don't know where our gifts are going to come from. We don't know who's going to surprise us. We don't know whose children are going to succeed. We don't know. But I do know that if we implement these strategies, we can put our children in better places. We can put our children in better places. I also regret to inform you that I had a really good slide. I don't know what happened in the process of me sharing this, 
But I had a really good slide, and I might have to just let you make a copy of these, of one of our church members, Miss Deborah, Deborah Watkins. She has an academy. She, she has a school. Like, what is this? Uh, she has an academy called Gift of Knowledge Academy, and it is for underserved populations. She takes these children out of a traditional school setting, she puts them in a smaller setting, and by the time they are finished in her academy, they have graduated with all kinds of awards. They read on three or four grade levels, surpassing their peers surpassing their peers. And this is because, I guess, one woman looked at those scores and was like, how can I work to close this gap? And again, I have her information. There is uh, tuition connected with her school. However, the school gives scholarships. She told me to let you all know. I wish that you could see a picture of Deaconess Watkins and her wonderful husband and their smiles all the time, but she truly inspires me. I also have um, another friend whose name is Vicki Thornville, Miss Vicki, just published a children's book about trucks. Her husband is a truck driver. He's not a truck driver. He actually owns his own company. He's a business owner of his own company. And Miss Vicki wrote a beautiful, colorful, colorful children's book about trucks. About trucks, okay? All right, she is putting our children in the room, okay? Last but not least, I would like to mention one of my former students, she's an equestrian. For those of us who are like, what is, what is she talking about? She trains horses. She owns horses. She lives on a ranch. She's that lady, that young lady, who if you called her, she would bring her little horse to your birthday party and everybody could, you know, ride the horse or whatever. Um, but she actually has now a series of books about a little black cowgirl named Cowgirl Cameron. And the first book is called Cowgirl Cameron and the Crazy Hair Day, okay? Sort of like what all of us had during COVID, like the first month. Who else had crazy hair? Okay? Or I had to do some slinking today. All right, so we have all of these amazing resources. We have these amazing resources. We have these amazing people. Again, I would encourage all of you, if we are in that have category, that working class, middle class, even consider ourselves upper class, to try and think about what we can do in order to help our brothers and sisters close this gap. I'm standing in there with you. I'm standing with you. Please email me if you need anything, anything except when is school opening. I can't help you with that. <laughs> I just can't do anything about that, okay? But if you want to talk about putting together a presentation or something that I said, please email me, okay? Thank you all for your time and attention. This is a subject that is very important to me. Um, I know it's a cliche to say I believe our children are our future, but they are. And we have to handle them with more than what we have. Thank you very much. Okay, Packet, uh, Barnes, you want me to tell you? Okay, that's not the one. That's definitely not it. Just stop right there. That's my school email. Um, do you want me to just say it? Okay, my email address, I'm going to say it slowly because my mom says I talk like everyone takes notes like I do. Barnes, which is lowercase b a r n e s, at the e, it's not like a barn that you put animals in, okay? There it is, dot E-D-O-N. Okay, my name is very short. Don't be adding a whole lot of uh, letters to it. Four letters, E-D-O-N, at yahoo.com. I promise I will get back to you before the morning with a packet. 
Not only is that packet have, does that packet have information about elementary ed, again, it has um, information about um, middle school, high school, it has some resources for people whose children are thinking about going into the workforce, all of those other amazing things. It has grade point average information. I tried to cover all the bases. All right, everyone, thank you. First, Ms. Barnes, we want to thank you for sharing the information with us, and we pray that it has, um, or it will be, a help to someone. And if you did not get the email address, you can always call the church, and we will make sure uh, that you get a packet, and I'm sure that it will bless you and your child, and so we ask you to please, please um, get a packet. Amen. Thank you for watching. Uh, may the Lord bless you real good, and until we meet again. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we thank you for this day. We ask you to continue to bless uh, Ms. Barnes in order that she might continue to share this information in order that people might be helped. But this is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.